Okay, good morning everyone. I'm ready to start here. And everybody got their recorders in place? Everything? No. Somewhere around paragraph two to four there, eh? Step four. Yeah. Yeah, we finished. Paragraph three. So we start in paragraph four. Um, so far, what we've considered is is um, about the the invitation, I guess you could call it, the invitation of Christ and the saints to the to the world. Uh, this is after the resurrection and judgment. They issue an invitation to the world to um, to submit to the divine authority that is at the hands of Christ and the saints. Um, I do remember that some requests were made for the uh, this Jewish commentator on the sounding of the shofar trumpet. So anybody that wants to distribute these around, maybe. Anyone? I did remember to make those up. But anyway, just talking about that, the uh, Brother Thomas is going back and making the connection to the the um, Hebrew New Year and the sounding of the shofar trumpet as the inauguration or the introduction of that. And that that was a type, of course, of this proclamation that was going out to the to the earth. And uh, just as a uh, maybe a, a recap of of that, we have a couple of summaries here. The first one is on the summary of the Day of Atonement uh, on the first day of the seventh month of the religious year, but the first month of the civil year. Uh, so the religious year suggests the covenant. The civil year suggests the new political beginning. There was a memorial of the blowing of trumpets. So gathering the people together, this was followed by days of contrition in which true Israelites mentally prepared to meet their God by meditating on their past conduct. Now that is the, and we had some discussion last week about, you know, what did they do during those 10, that 10 day period from the uh, blowing of trumpets of the, the new year to the Day of Atonement. So this was followed by days of contrition in which true Israelites mentally prepared to meet their God by meditating on their past conduct. On the tenth day of the month, the Day of Atonement was commemorated. The morning lamb was offered as usual to smolder all day. There was a special offering by fire comprising a bullock, which was symbolic of labor, a ram, meaning strength, seven lambs having to do with the covenant, and a goat, or symbolizing the waywardness of man, for a sin offering. The bullock, ram, and lambs are offered as burnt offerings with their meal offerings, which is, means the results of personal labor. The burnt offering represented the offerer's complete dedication of self in relation to those things indicated by the offerings. And the goat was, as a sin offering, was a recognition of the waywardness of flesh and the need to deny it in order to render fit worship to Yahweh. So that is kind of a type of what goes on at the, in this uh, proclamation period. And uh, there is a period of time then for people to, uh, as it talks about here, days of contrition for people to consider their status and the changes they need to make in order to be fit for the new divine rulership that is being inaugurated. Um, so that kind of takes us there too, what we're just talking about, the antitypical, what all these things mean. The Day of Atonement was called Yom Kippurim, or Day of Offerings. It foreshadowed the work of Christ in providing forgiveness of sins. The Epistle to the Hebrews is built around this festival of the law, and the following are some of the antitypical lessons. Christ provides a covering for his people, or of his people. He passed through the heavens to the most holy. He is competent to help the ignorant and the erring. His appointment is of Yahweh. And you know, so all these come from the Hebrews, so all these um, anti-types. He is high priest after the order of Melchizedek. His one offering was complete in itself. He entered the Most Holy through his own blood. 
His atonement completely removes sin. His offering accomplished this by going beyond the scope of law into the realm of grace, which is the next level. Through His own offering, He gained redemption. Through Him, both priest and priesthood were cleansed, and the Day of Atonement in the age to come will be extended to include the people. So much of the misunderstanding of John 14, 1 and 3 uh, just as a note here, can be removed when we understand that Jesus, the greater high priest, was speaking parabolically. John 14, course 1 to 3, is, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. The work of who? The priest. And if I go and prepare a place for you, goes into the most holy, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. That was his work to do and his work only and that's why he was saying, you know, they couldn't follow him there. But he would prepare and make that work available to them, to his, to his disciples. So, he was speaking parabolically, alluding to the high priest's atonement for the sins of the people as is seen in Leviticus 9. Likewise, Jesus must first offer the sacrifice, then present it. He goes then to the Most Holy, prepares a place, he presents it in the Divine Presence, and in due course comes forth or returns to bless the people in the name of Yahweh. The literal going away requires a literal return, at which time occurs all the activities prefigured by the Day of Coverings. So, you know, when we understand this, John 14 comes alive with meaning. And it's, there, there is no room for misunderstanding of it. Gordon? It does make a lot of sense. You know, and he was, he was uh, issuing a, a very uh, powerful statement there, but kind of goes over the head until you understand the, the types that's that's um, um, basically it comes from Ron Abel's book Rest of Scripture as a note there on that it's very good I thought yeah yeah and, and you know that's it's true that that's what he's done but when you understand the work that he's doing there like when you when, when you can go back to the to the priest and the day of the atonement and the, and the work that was done and that's what Christ was doing he was accomplishing everything that was prefigured in that day of atonement by his work Yeah, right. You can't come. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. But he will come back out and, and you know, carrying the carrying the results of the of the work back to the people and, and uh then then they would be able to through that work uh, meet their God, so to speak. Yeah. Enter in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So with that bit of uh, you know reminder where we're at here, we'll just take up with paragraph four. The angel who makes the memorial proclamation is symbolical of the royal priests of the Melchizedek household. In other words, the the saints. It will be their work. The mosaic type required that the silver trumpets be blown, be blown by priests of the high priest's family. But the priesthood being changed, the Aaronic priests are ineligible for the sounding of this proclamation in mid heaven. Hence, the priestly trumpeters have to be provided from another source. And there is no other source of supply but the saints and faithful in Christ Jesus whom he has made kings and priests for the deity. The proclamation is therefore made by as many of the 144,000 as the work to be performed may demand. 
among these will among these will be the Apostle John as the representative of a class. In the tenth chapter he tells us that after he had digested the little scroll of judgment, the Spirit told him that he must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. To do this he must rise from the dead, be judged, and be quickened when he will be fitted for the work. But it is too much for one man to accomplish in a short space allotted for the proclamation. Others of like qualifications will therefore be associated with him in the work so that it may be carted on different countries at the same time. The apostles had their co-laboring attendants and subordinates when they sounded the gospel trumpet in old time. In the new proclamation, the same condition may obtain. Be this as it may, it is those that escape, or the saved remnant that are sent as sounders of the truth to the nations that have not heard the fame nor seen the glory of Yahweh, and they shall declare his glory to the Gentiles. As in Isaiah 66:19. I will set a sign among them, and I will send those that escape of them unto the nations, to Tarshish, Pul, and Lud, that draw the bow, to Tubal, and Javan, to the isles afar off, that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. This is the plurality represented by the angel. One messenger emblematic of a multitude as it is written in Psalm 68:11 Adonai will give the word those who bear the tidings are a great host so just as a brief recap of the paragraph the angel who makes this proclamation is representative of the multitudinous Christ those who are the righteous redeemed and are called to be among the symbolic number of the 144,000 they go forth make the proclamation. Pardon? It sort of gives a different take on it from the most uh, Christendom when you hear that the gospel is going to be preached in the whole world. Well, if they have never heard, then it's obviously mm-hmm. not. So either the, the timing of that or, or the whole idea is not based on too much. There's, you know, all of these things are, there's more than one application quite often and and one becomes symbolic of the other. And he talks about um, the apostles and their co-laboring attendants and subordinates when they sound the gospel trumpet in old time. And when they did that, I think the then known world did hear it. It, it went into all the world. However, we're in a different world now. And I think there's probably a lot of places that that have not heard, will not hear. And uh, to, to pick up the slack on that, that's when the, the proclamation will be will be made. And but yeah, I think it's it's beyond our it's beyond our scope now in this time to be able to to, to do that. <coughs> Peters. I heard a man speaking, and he said the way that people are moving from one country to another, it's, a, it's becoming a, a problem of language to uh, advertise. It. Mm-hmm. And I thought, yes, the day's coming when we'll have one language. Well, that's true. Um, it would be a solution. Whether that will obtain at that, that particular time, or whether that will still be at a, at a you know, we're, we're talking uh, at a, in an early period of the 50-year time, and it, there there may not well yes of a Pentecostal type of to hear them all in their own time yeah, as sure as possible. Yeah. We, we know that those barriers will be bridged, whatever it takes. Otherwise, that 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 wouldn't be that prophecy would not be fulfilled. I thought that was an interesting yeah. 
I think, yeah, it's, I think what he's talking about there are those who have come out from the world at, at, in, in this time of probation would be those who escape and who are judged, found, found worthy. Um, but yes, they will be of all different languages. And, but I, I, I kind of like Beatrice's suggestion that, you know, I mean, you know what, we know what happened at Pentecost. And a similar sort of thing could obtain at that time. Delma? I think part of it's interesting that Israel does with their uh, new kind. Like they have people from all over the world, all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. But they really don't let them assimilate until they've had two years to keep them. And right. it could be a big learning process like that. Because they're learning their language. Yeah. And then they all speak, you know, and then by the next generation. Yeah, it's true. It'd be uh, you know, it'd be a big program, but I mean, like I say, there's um, there's time, there's time to do it. See? It? When you think about the, the process that has taken place many times in in the world in the last fifteen years, uh, where people have been assimilated into a larger uh, administration and have have broken out and gone back to their original languages and and uh, you know in the name of independence. I can see that same process being set up and played out when the nations rise up against Christ at the end of a thousand years, and that would be sort of a you know the the imposition of of the language upon the peoples. The Hebrew language of 20 peoples could be quite real mm-hmm. and, uh, and would be a point of, of soreness amongst those who wanted independence. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, there's polit- political, um, you know, there's political ramifications to all, all of this, and, you know, it's, it's very, it gets very involved. Um, the language is very symbolic of you know people have a lot of pride in their in their language. It's symbolic of their identity and their 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 nation and everything. It's you know what it's like in Canada with our two languages. It gets uh, gets very political at times. But that is that that is something that uh, one of the things that will be overcome in that time, and it will not probably not come easy. Not without its attendant trials. Gordon? Well, we know that the label was the confusion of the languages. Right. Therefore, that would be the undoing of that. Eventually. Right. To to the uniting of the world under one language, one government. Yes, I think that, uh, you know, at this particular time, I believe it's after that initial. after the initial defeat of Gob and his hosts, um, and that will that will have had a tremendous impact on the world as far as establishing the divine presence and authority, and I think that will certainly help a lot in what has to be done thereafter. Uh, highway goes out of Egypt into Assyria. You know, there's a lot of things that take place that, that tend to unite the nations and and. Uh, the bridging of the language barrier certainly would be a part of that. I think. I noticed there the, that there's more than just chauffeur trumpets involved. Um, the chauffeur horn. Uh, there are the silver trumpets as well. And he brings this out here, and it's alluding to uh, Numbers 10, uh, verse 2. It says, "Make thee two trumpets of silver of a whole piece. Shalt thou make them." And that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. 
So there was the there was the silver trumpets, and they were used um, for well, it tells them when when they had to be used here, and. Uh, Verse 8, he just says, uh, he talks about if the trumpet will give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for the battle? And uh, verse 9 speaks about going to war in your land against the enemy that oppresses you, then you shall blow an alarm with the trumpets. That was another instance. And uh, also in the day of your gladness and in your solemn days, in the beginnings of your month, you shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings. So the trumpets were sounded on days of national thanksgiving that were celebrated with religious services such as the Feast of Dedication and of Purim. They were blown in the solemn days, that is, days that were set aside as festivals under the law, such as are recorded in Numbers 28 and 29. They were also blown at the beginnings of the months, which were celebrated with religious services as denoting new beginnings. So I think there was more than just the chauffeur horn that was used in these. I think the silver trumpet was uh, used for the sounding of the um, you know, calling to attention that, that this feast was. Uh, that it was time to observe the feast. It's not whatever type it might have been. The army. Yeah. So the next one, we talk about where this uh, is located and what the impact of this Midheaven proclamation is. The proclamation is to be made through Midheaven. This is the air into which the judgments of the seventh vial are to be poured after the proclamation of the message or word given is finished. It is the political aerial of Babylon the Great. And... Uh, I think you were just mentioning that, Gordon, in your comment about this. This is the subduing of Babylon the Great that is after which all this uh, takes place. So it is the political aerial of Babylon the Great, which instead of being as now the highest heaven of the political world, will occupy a middle station between the worshippers of the beast and the new throne established in Mount Zion. The mid-heaven is the political firmament occupied by all the ranks, orders, and degrees of the world rulers the supreme and subordinate governors of those many people, nations and tongues before whom John is to prophesy again. This will be an exceedingly interesting time when the clergy of all orders, the spirituals of wickedness in the heavenlies, shall be confronted by the apostles and saints and proved to be liars and impostors before the world. And richly do they deserve to be exposed to this shame and contempt. They will no longer be permitted to deceive the hearts of the simple with good words and fair speeches with impunity. The sheep's clothing will be stripped off them, and the wolf undisguised will be revealed. High and pompous ecclesiastical titles will then be at a discount and regarded only by those who come to obey the proclamation as the tinsel bespanglement of vain and foolish men. The occupation of the clerical false prophet of the world will be gone, for the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low. Yahweh alone will come to be exalted in that day. That's from Isaiah 2.17. So, recapping that, he's saying that the mid-heaven is a place of authority and power, the political and ecclesiastical heavens. The multitudinous Christ will rightfully occupy this position. There will be no more place given to the beast in his image as the truth will be shown regarding its lies, deceit, and falsehood and leading the ignorant to death. Teachers? Does that mean that, like in England, that the Anglican Church is the state church? Mm-hmm. Will the saints take place of the Archbishop and speak to the people? 
because you see Brother Thomas keeps the blood going to the horse's bridles. Well, that's the leader. That horse's bridle is the leader. They're the ones that we get pleased and the things mm-hmm. put in there. I think that's how they work. <laughs> they will do that, that job, yeah. <laughs> That's where they're saying all these entrapments of the buildings and everything that goes with it will not be a part of that. Um, but the authority will be established. Uh, the authority of... of um, yeah. I don't think it would be fitting if they were just kind of slaughtered in to what looks like the church because most people think of the church is just one church and the church I think will still exist for for quite a while I mean that's um, that's a part of the um, the Catholic uh, confederacy that is the last to be overthrown really um, so I think that exists for quite a while but uh, what it's talking about here is this, the the authority of the Proclaimers supersedes the authority of the that goes forth from the church. Yeah. It has it has to be seen as as the opposition. Yeah. And it will be thought of in many circles as the antichrist. I think too. Uh, you know, I've heard uh, I've heard it said that you know, there will be a backlash happening once. Uh, you know, once the general population that is remaining becomes aware that they've been sold a bill of goods mm-hmm. all down through the ages, and and that really fits because you know then you have the, the work of the multitudinous Christ showing showing the truth as opposed to the lies, and so then that would be the beginning of that process. So they would be brought down in the end by the very people that they had deceived. Uh, a little bit of poetic justice right the the political supremacy will already be occupied by Christ and the saints because that first first phase of the Armageddon battle is is over but the religious uh, battle uh, the battle to overthrow the religious um, powers which will kind of take and occupy the place that formerly was occupied by Go. Um, it happens toward the, the last of that 50 year period I think first it is a military imposition of yeah. that political will of, uh, of Christ's rule the second may be more a battle within initially a battle within the, the heart of that, to uh, establish establish some uh, some new thinking in order to in order to have I mean they could destroy the church but they still it still wouldn't destroy what's in people's hearts and minds about what it taught until until there is some uh, some background work done for them to rethink their position. You know, and the proclamation goes out to to accomplish that to to win the hearts of the people over, yeah. uh, and and it will be moderately successful, but not totally. And yeah. Uh, by those who resist that, it will Christ and the saints will be looked on as as the Antichrist, and so there will be a military mustering towards the time of the end to finally and once and for all overthrow this Antichrist. That implies our job today, I believe. Mm-hmm. Put the word out there, uh, principally about the. Uh, about the Antichrist, I think it's a, it should be a, a big and important part of our message so that when that time comes for people to look at this situation and, and think about, you know, is this the Antichrist or is it Christ? We've given them some kind of an information to, uh, to work with. Well, there certainly is a big, big message going out there these days, of, uh, you know, a wrong message about what the Antichrist is and yeah. you can see it uh, having its uh, adverse effects and, and you know when when things come to a head 
going to call it's going to cause people to look on Christ once again like the Pharisees did and call him the child of the devil. We have sort of uh, John the Baptist duty on mm-hmm. our plate like, really, you know. Voice yeah. one crying in the Lord is prepare the way of the Lord. It's true. <clears throat> Same conditions in this really. Yeah. Ignorance of God's word and mm-hmm. Being uh, convinced that the uh, the one who comes to claim uh, his title is an imposter. Right. The world is looking for something. Yeah. No. Because they want it now. Yeah. And there's no description. That proof that God is not a prophet or something. I want to get that Which one is that? The pope, oh, the Pope, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. <coughs> that John, I was just forget where we ran in the boat with John. Yeah, that whole oh, race of prophecies. He didn't talk about the apostle. Is that, uh, that John on the Isle of Papa? Yeah. yeah. No, no, this is uh, this was the uh, yeah. See this man that was talking to me. He said there's better be some meaning to give him. Said, well, he democracy spread over the world. Hmm. Well, true democracy, yes. Actually. Democracy is, isn't the, the ideal no. setup. It's, no. it's dictatorship. Yeah. That's, uh, that's the tail driving the ox. Yeah. See, the ox is the man. You go down. I was just looking for that passage. That is in Revelations, I think, where it tells him he's to, pro- he's to prophesy again or to proclaim before many people, nations, and tongues. But it wasn't in chapter 14. I'm not sure where that is. in the first chapter. A lot of people these days don't know if you don't know if you don't know if you Anyway, the point is that he was to, to do it and uh, he is to be a part of it and he is representative of a, of a class that will be doing that. Uh, Revelation 10 and 11. He said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And that's a similar chapter. That's a kin chapter to chapter 14 where it gives a, a picture of the, the end time. Um, leading up to which the succeeding events will, will happen. Okay, now he goes on to paragraph 6 and he talks about the situation which is this uh, the situation of the mid-heaven. Um, and paragraph 6 is talking about mid-heaven as a place of power as is shown by the angel to King David. The situation is illustrated by First Chronicles 21.16 where it is stated that David saw the angel of Yahweh stand between the earth and the heaven in mid-heaven having a drawn sword 
in his hand stretched out as he was just going to afflict uh, as he was just going to afflict Jerusalem with impending judicial visitation. First uh, Chronicles 21 and 6. 16 is it? Yeah. David looked up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and the heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders of Israel who were clothed in sackcloth fell upon their faces. So that was the... And verse 15, preceding it, God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord beheld and repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed, It is enough. Stay down thine hand. So then he gave uh, gave an opportunity, as it were, for uh, for change of direction on that. His position there was exhibited to David, as David David saw it, that he might have time and occasion for obtaining the deliverance of the city from the wrath to come, so that the hovering of the angel was to show that there was room for escape on terms to be proposed, just as the deity was going to inflict the punishment. So with the great host in mid-heaven on their proclamation of the good news, the destruction of Babylon and the overthrow of the governance of the world are decreed. Nothing can save them from abrogation and obliteration. The proclamation invites mankind to abandon these spiritual and temporal institutions in commanding them to fear the deity and give glory to him. It affords them time an opportunity for saving themselves from the impending calamities of the hour of divine judgment. If any transfer their allegiance from their clerical and civil rulers to the land power, they will doubtless be exempted from the fire and brimstone torment which is to destroy the beast and the false prophet. But if they refuse to abjure these authorities or to... um, change from them, the plagues written in this prophecy for their destruction will assuredly consume the rebellious. So, similar to the angel of Yahweh in the days of David, the multitudinous Christ will occupy this mid-heaven position and will proclaim the gospel to the mortal population, giving them opportunity to accept or, or else await the impending judgment accept Christ, accept the message, or await the impending judgment if they refuse it. A couple of quotations there, one from 19, verse 20, about the, um, the beast that was slain, and with the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. The the beast is significant of the, the, uh, again, the Catholic Confederacy with, with all its attendant denominations. And 14, verse that's later, later on in this chapter, And the third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead, or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So again, that would be referring to the the uh, second, as it were, the second Armageddon, and between the between the two judgments, there will be this proclamation in in mid heaven in the space between. You know, it's a little bit like we talked about in, in the in the seven habits about you know the, the space between action and reaction. You know, you, you give a space, you give a 
period of time there to consider, you know, is this something I really want to do or not? And uh, that, that's a little bit like it's going to be on a, on a higher spiritual and political level to people. Yeah. I'm just trying to get my mind around. This is happening before the temple is built, right? Yes. Yes, this is the time yeah. before that. And I think it kind of goes on even now, even, yeah. even during, yeah. yeah but it, it it's uh, it's inaugurated or, or begun before that. Before yeah. the preaching and resurrection, mm-hmm. I make a mark on people. Yeah. Because I have told us that when I come back, I'll come and see you. Mm-hmm. Was the response? Is that kind of woke him up a little bit? Yeah. Let's see what I've been talking. Gordon? I'll be back. I'll be back. We see a quite a difference uh, like today there, the message is there for those who want to dig for it but in that day it will be right in their face mm-hmm. be, you have a choice to seek the way walk in or refuse and accept the consequences so it will be quite a different outlook because there's many people today that just maybe wouldn't if it was in their face, wouldn't refuse it. Yeah. But they just don't feel they have to make a choice, so they don't. They just kind of, and in a sense, they do make a choice, but not make a choice. And there always seems to have to be something to, to get people's attention, you know. They have to hit them over the head with a bat, as it were, and get their attention. And, uh, you know, in, in the days of the apostles, when they first went out, they were attended with signs and wonders and miracles got people's attention and there, will be that. and there will be that again you know with the uh, with the coming of Christ and the saints and and the the overthrow of a huge conglomerate military force I mean it's, it's going to cause people to wake up and think a little bit they may put the wrong spin on it but it, no but I mean you got to get the attention they, they, they got to be able to, to assimilate the message somehow and then they got their choice to make yeah but what I'm saying is when they see uh, you know that it's not uh, just a stagnant stagnant uh, force that they're dealing with it, it will give something to cause them to ponder it's not passive it's not passive see almost a, a reversal of the process um, you know, people generally in at this time have an opportunity whether they're even going to listen to the message or not. Whether they just stop and listen to the message. And if they do stop and listen to the message, they have an opportunity to choose it. In the future, that message will be, like Gordon said, in their face. Servitude to God will be imposed. And so, but have to remember that the whole mortal population goes through the process of exercising free choice when it comes down to the end of the yeah. so, it, so it's kind of a, a, re, a reverse of that process. They will they will have it. They will be given it. They will be it will be put in their in their face, and then they will have to maintain an obedience to it. And there will be a time of choice. It won't be when they first hear it. It'll be after they've had it for many, many years. They'll have the choice given to them again to continue to serve God or to choose to go along with this new independence movement. You know, you look at this passage about uh, what happened in David's time. And it wasn't that God sent the angel just to say to the people, you know, you've been naughty and disobedient, you have to change. 
uh, God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it and as he was destroying as he was destroying the Lord beheld and you know said now is the time you know hold, hold back and issue a proclamation but it wasn't uh, before a lot of destruction had already taken place so that's kind of what we're saying that these, there, there's it always seems to be attendant with something that, that causes people to sit up and take notice um, similar you know again going back to the times of the apostles I mean there was the a little different nature but it was still something that caused them to sit up and take notice here were these men you know speaking healing people speaking uh, great things and attended with signs and wonders so really uh, underscores how thankful we can be in a dispensation when there isn't that that uh, real tap on the shoulder or whack over the head to pay attention we, we've been given the opportunity to quietly pay attention yeah it's you know that's so easy to take that for granted too it is it, you know and we do we do take it for granted Awesome opportunity. I wonder if, like Job, adversary is skin for skin. Mm-hmm. All that a man has will he give for his life. And that might be a point. Yeah. It's a, it's a sense of urgency and a fear of loss that has to be attended to. You know. Take massive and immediate action. Okay, our time is up. Finish off at the end of paragraph six.